Hey everyone, welcome to night two of Film Music Media's second annual symposium. We're here with another amazing panel of composers and storytellers. I'm Kai Sabas, I'm the founder of Film Music Media. So let's just jump right in and introduce our panel. First up, she is a composer at Bleeding Fingers Music who has scored projects like Eden, Untamed Planet and Primates. Please welcome Denise Santos. Denise, how's it going? Gaia, how are you? Nice to see you. All right. Next, uh, he's a composer and sound designer for film and theater who most recently worked on Sundance documentary, A Glitch in the Matrix. Please welcome Jonathan Snipes. Hi, how are you? Thanks. Hey, Jonathan. All right. Next, he is a composer of the video game Chivalry 2 and documentary uh, Pencil Test. Please welcome J.D. Spears. Last but not least, he is the editor and composer of the documentary Twyla Moose and the founder of Oscillator Media. Please welcome Louis Rapkin. Louis, hey. how's it going? All right, so to start off, I'm going to start with a very pretty broad question here. You all play such an important role in the making of film and television. Um, how would you describe the role of score in, in storytelling? Can maybe just one person jump in and say, what is score to you? What is the function of score and what does it mean in storytelling? Pretty broad, but I think it is a good way to start the conversation. I One of my favorite um, early lessons when I started scoring was that the music is a character in the film. So I think that's how I hear and see score nowadays. And then with documentaries, which I've been doing lately, the music is really more like enhancing or enhancing the information that is being given to you by narration mm -hmm. and research. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone yeah, else? I like, any... I, I like that a lot. Like uh, thinking of the music as a character. I. Um, I think of this interview with Jad Abumrad, who makes Radio Lab that I heard ages ago, uh, uh, all the time, where he talks about um, music being the character in the movie that knows the most about what's going on, and being kind of this omniscient wind that kind of guides the characters through, and it's its job to say to the audience, "Hey, pay attention to this. This is important here. Uh, this character is learning something, and not necessarily manipulate you into thinking or feeling a certain way, but to just say, "Hey, let's put a pin in this right now." Uh, and I really like that thinking of it. I think of the music as like keeping a balloon in the air too. <laughs> but it's like it's like when the energy drops, you want to sort of hit it and toss it back. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's just fascinating because it's like you know, storytelling, visual storytelling is about the illusion of reality. Unless you're doing like a documentary, nonfiction, or something. But and there's no music in real life. But for some reason, it just it's needed there. It's needed in that storytelling but you're not walking down the street having, i mean it would be great to have a score behind you walking down the street but yeah um but, <laughs> i think but it can same, vary from yeah go ahead oh sorry i mean no, go ahead. I, I, I was just gonna say i think it can vary from project to project as far as you know the specific role of it but i think generally the way i sort of like to think of it is the role of scores to sort of draw you into a, a feeling or an emotion or moment or setting um that's hopefully already there on the screen and you're almost sort of giving the, the viewers uh, permission to say, you know, like, come on, let's let's go along with this. Let's get lost in this. It's kind of, uh, I mean, again, some scores can really transcend that and, and be more than that too, but in, in a positive way. But I think some of the best scores are, are sort of enhancing what's already there. Absolutely. So on the kind of same topic of the role of, of score and storytelling, there are times when, you know, a scene calls for a suspenseful or emotional cue. Are there any examples of how any of you have tackled this in a recent project? How, how much do you believe music should guide the viewer without, I guess, stepping into that, you know, manipulation or puppet stringing emotions? Um, I'm curious, Jonathan and Lewis, if you have any uh, examples of kind of finding that line. Yeah, I can jump in. Um, I mean, what comes to mind for me, I, I worked on a documentary, Libya's Quiet War. It was a doc for Vice, and it was about a conflict in Libya. And we had a scene that kind of had to toe both of those lines. It was suspenseful and emotional at the same time, which was kind of a difficult um, to, to have like both of those emotions going on at once. Yeah. But you know, it, it was both you know, soldiers on the ground and suspense and, you know, there was conflict and a war, but there was also kind of elders explaining the emotional toll on the, on the people. And so you were kind of really had to balance this line of like, you wanted to be with the soldiers there where it's really, there's adrenaline and it's intense, but it's documentary. You don't want it to be an action movie and be heavy handed. So we were also kind of like making it, you know, addressing the emotional nature to it. And so the music actually, I feel like helped um balance those two the duality of the scene it can help you know gel those two together and, and like relate the two of them absolutely 
Jonathan, I was curious if you have any examples. Yeah, I mean, um, since you mentioned a Glitch in the Matrix, which is the last like feature length documentary that I've done, uh, which is sort of an unusual documentary in that most of the talking head characters were replaced with uh, these sort of animated avatars, um, mm. which are which are sort of silly and and they're kind of they're kind of funny, but they're also very um, they're very relatable and we take them very seriously in the film. Um, and the score was all sort of made out of these like sort of digital glitches and errors. Um, so it was very kind of like, uh, it, was, it was a very aesthetically driven score that wanted to sound like it's sort of in the fabric of digital audio sort of breaking apart and it's pulling out those little sounds uh, and yet finding then ways to manipulate those kind of uh, glitches into sort of more traditional musical material and then have the, uh, give the, have the, those give emotional weight and depth to these to these characters that on the surface could look like you know cartoons that we don't take very seriously but we you know we did really want you the audience to 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 empathize with um to empathize with these these interview subjects and i you know i certainly did working on the film um and so these little moments where where suddenly you know i'm sitting running processes like turning something back and forth into the worst quality mp3 over and over and over again trying to get it to, to glitch and break up and find these little errors in it and suddenly it makes something really beautiful and it's like oh grab that and stick that under this scene and then sort of write something around that um the, those are the moments that were really fun to find was in these these iterative and like sort of programmatic um, processes generated something that was accidentally beautiful that then i could sort of take and amplify yeah absolutely yeah um, Denise, I want to throw it over to you uh, now to talk about BBC's Eden Untamed Planet. Uh, how do you approach scoring uh, a nature documentary like this? I grew up, you know, I grew up on Discovery Channel back when it wasn't like, you know, mermaid, you know, finding mermaids when it was actual <laughs> real documentaries, but I love what BBC Earth does. Um, uh, do you create a different sound palettes for different animals and, and creatures we see? How do you find, like, you're I think I talked to um, some fellow Bleeding Fingers music like uh, Dave Fleming. Dave Fleming was helping out on one of the other ones and he's saying, kind of have to find like a narrative in the story too to kind of score something but I'm just curious from your take and how did you approach it there's there's definitely that like you want to assign sometimes like an instrument to a certain animal just to stay consistent mm. um and then there's also um working with a theme so with Eden Untamed Planet I worked on it alongside Austin Hammonds and he did the theme for the show so we used a lot of um, that theme and just kind of made variations of it depending on location, depending on what animal we're trying to feature. And speaking of location, so Eden was yeah. six episodes all in different, like one was Borneo, one was in Namibia, one was in Patagonia, so Alaska and two others. And then they're all different landscapes so we did have to find like the sound of a certain location and we stuck to that throughout. So the, the interesting approach to me that I find I do differently with documentaries is that I like to score with the dialogue or no, the narration on mm. because these animals, these landscapes don't talk. So a lot of right. what the audience is absorbing in the final product is what the narration is saying so you know I, there is this one scene where there's these um penguins in the middle of Patagonia and it was it looked like a very dangerous scene but actually we were heading towards a more hopeful scene because a tornado was coming and it was actually going to help them free them out of that area had I scored that without the dialogue or sorry, the narration, I, I would have gone really dangerous, but actually yeah. was supposed to be hopeful. <laughs> like you see a tornado, you don't think that's great. <laughs> like, that's no. right. But like based on that story, it, you know, it was actually a good thing for the penguins. So that got that kind of stuff. Sorry, not penguins, flamingos. <laughs> Oh, but yeah. it's, I mean, people don't realize also, like, I think uh, when you, when people check out on team, you know, you should listen to the narration because it is kind of the performance and you have to, you can't step on that either. You have to give that performance a, a place in the mix too. So the music yeah. can cross over and probably mess things up too. I'm sure that's I mean, there, are, there are rare occasions where I mute the narration just so I can really listen to the harmonies and all that. Right. And then I over-orchestrate it and then I 
put the narration back on and I'm like, okay, that is stepping on everything else. So you have to yeah. kind of be conscious <laughs> about how you mix all that stuff. Absolutely. Um, so jumping over to, to, to JD, uh, JD scored the multiplayer action game, uh, Chivalry 2. What is the, the process like for creating music for a video game and how's it different from maybe other projects you've worked on? I know gaming is more active, you know, coming from the player and I'm, I'm wondering how you approach, you know, in-game music and how it, you know, moves the player through the game. Yeah. Um, so it, it, you know, it can be quite different for sure. I mean, fundamentally, a lot of it is the same, but um, you know, even in the game space, you know, it, it can be different game to game. I mean, some some games have, you know, narratives where each moment, each beat is, you know, tightly scripted and controlled by the developers. Uh, and then a game like Chivalry 2, which is a, you know, a, an online competitive multiplayer game, um, there is a setting and there is lore and there is a story that kind of places the player uh, on the battlefield for a reason and there's motivation, objectives moving them forward and stuff. But a lot of the moment to moment storytelling is done by the players and how they interact with one another. Um, and so from that perspective, um, as a composer, I sort of have to look at it as I'm scoring a scenario. I'm writing music for a setting and a scenario. Um, and the music, you know, along with the visuals and the sound design and things like that um, are, are sort of just creating a, a setting and a vibe for, um, for the player to sort of exist in and hopefully get lost in as they compete with each other. Um, so yeah, and, and then the other thing about it is, you know, much of the much of the music in the game, like a lot of other games, is dynamic. And right. so I, I was sort of having to, you know, look at everything in layers. Um, a lot of the cues were, you know, broken long pieces of music broken up into layers uh, so that the programmers can sort of um, decide, you know, how intense the music is depending on what's going on in a given match. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, it is, it's, it's very different from a, uh, you know, a creative approach standpoint in that way, uh, as well as a workflow standpoint for that reason. Absolutely. And gaming has changed, I mean, drastically changed over the years. And I think the oh, game is sure. becoming more interesting and more dynamic and just, you know, ass essentially the game is kind of composing sometimes in real time for the, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And so you, as, as a composer, you sort of have to be open to that and be open to not having you know, the kind of control you would for a more linear, you know, piece of media. And there are, you know, scenes and things in the game that I approach the same way I would a film or a TV show or whatever. But right. yeah, but you're, you're totally right. For the most part, the, the game is sort of, uh, you have to give it that flexibility in the way you're writing the music too. So. Absolutely. Um, so uh, Lewis, jumping over to you, you were both the composer and editor for the documentary Twyla Moves, and it's based on the legendary dance and choreographer Twyla Tharp. Um, how did you balance both of these roles? I mean, I can't think of the only other person I can think of that does that is maybe John Ottman, but balancing editing and, and composing, how do you kind of switch those two parts of your brain on and off or do you separate them or you do them together? I'm curious about your process. Um, yeah, I do them together. I mean, and it's a great to have the opportunity to do that because they, they certainly inform each other. I mean, there's a similarity to like, dealing with something rhythmic and the pacing of things and how you structure things and how you're trying to get to some kind of e emotion in a scene. And it's really great to be able to do the two like at, at the same time. So as the edit's really rough and you're not really sure where it's gonna go, what the tone's gonna be, how you know fast, slow, whatever, um, to be kind of in the same place with the music uh, can be really helpful. And it's kind of like exponentially makes, makes the things um, better. And with Twyla Moves, I mean, she she's a choreographer, so there was just tons of archival of dancing, which is also yeah. kind of very rhythmic, works in phrasing. Um, visually, there was just a lot to, to latch onto there. So for that project in particular, it was a really fun one to be able to do both at the same time. Um, also in that documentary, I mean, it spanned you know, many decades, so I was able to do some fun stuff with the music, like you know, in the 60s, using some of the musical technology from the 60s, it's electric pianos, and then as you move into the 70s, some of the early synthesizers, and then the 80s, kind of the different synths in that moment. And so you could sort of use the score to sort of play off her career and the different transitions um, over the years. Um, so yeah, I always, I always love the opportunity to kind of build the edit and the music at the same time, rather than having like a locked scene to score to. But, you know, you get ideas from the music too, as, as to edit. Um, so they kind of. And you can avoid uh, having to follow your own temp, I guess. 
Exactly. <laughs> do you, I'm curious, do you actually uh, use any temp music before you actually write original or do you to kind of help you structure a scene or do you find a, a pattern first and then fill it in with music? It's a like project, but I mean, I try to, for something like documentary, which is pretty much exclusively what I do, there's, you know, I'm trying to digest the information already yeah. uh, for the edit. And while I'm digesting it for the edit, in terms of what the story is going to be, what the scenes have to be, I'm also thinking about it musically. So I do like to kind of start with really rough music, the kind of music you wouldn't share with anybody yeah. else. They wouldn't, you know, understand. But it's the same way with the with the edit. You know, there are at times it's so rough that it's it's unwatchable. But you and your head know, like, okay, I'm I'm like making a little bit of a blueprint here. And kind of doing the same for the music, like starting out different tones, different little rhythms. And so, yeah, my rough edits look crazy because they don't have kind of music that's a completed piece of music to at least latch onto. It's this sort of rough bits and pieces of music to go along with the rough bits and pieces of, of the edit. But as the two kind of come, you know, build together, it, it, it can work. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, props to you. I think that's amazing just to have them keeping that all together in your brain too, and just kind of having that layout too. But speaking of uh, people who wear two hats, uh, Jonathan, you've also worked uh, on a project where you've had more than one role. And, you know, for Glitch in the Matrix, you were credited as the composer and sound designer. Um, mm -hmm. It seems like those two would go hand in hand, but I'm curious, uh, was it difficult? Was it hard to, uh, do, you, do you think of it as hand in hand, the whole one thing, or do you try to keep things separate and how they work together? Uh, I mean, I, I definitely think it is, like when it, when, it, when it's successful, uh, it is it does feel like one gesture, sound and music. You know, the soundtrack of a of a film is one is sort of one piece of it. I mean, a film is a complete piece in and of itself, and then the soundtrack. Right. You know, uh, the, the, those elements should complement each other. I mean, it's it feels very natural for me. I think because I have a theater background, and in a theater background, mm -hmm. when you're the sound designer, you are responsible for every part of the sound that you hear. And there isn't this sort of compartmentalization that there is in film. Okay. Um, you know, I also make a lot of experimental music and field recordings and music concrete. Um, and so to me, the idea of like recording sound effects and putting them under action is not really a dissimilar like creative gesture from writing a piece of music on a piano and putting that under action, that those are very related. Um, that being said, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, Lewis, I was like pretty, I'm just sort of pretty, pretty, pretty impressed that you can sort of wear those two very sort of different and very time consuming hats because I know how incredibly difficult it is to do the sound design and the music at the same time, which are very similar. Uh, and it's something that I really only do um, on very specific projects when I have a lot of trust from right. the directorial and editorial side. So I've done, I think, three or four features for Rodney Asher who did Glitch in the Matrix in both capacities. Um, it's incredibly hard and it's really really fun and I wouldn't do it any other way that's awesome yeah I think sound design is uh something that people should pay more attention to because it's so specific I mean so calculated and specific to creating certain emotions and build even building a scene and kind of put even working with the music to push things in a certain way and so absolutely so props to you for for juggling all of that <laughs> <laughs> but uh looking at uh media as a whole and the process of writing cues for them how do you decide uh, what parts of the project should have a heavy amount of, you know, stems and instrumentation, uh, instrumentation versus a more minimalistic approach? And I'm, I'm, I'll pitch this to, to Denise and JD. I'd love to hear, you know, talking about that kind of approach and how you decide when to kind of make it streamlined and minimal, or really kind of throw everything at it and kind of make it as rich as possible. I really like rely on the picture for these things, picture and narration, as I have said. Um, sometimes when it's a big um, wide shot of a nice landscape, then it's a signal for me that, you know, we become thematic and we become um, big orchestrally. And then when it's, you know, focused, zoomed in on a, an animal bouncing around, then it kind of is a signal to me to be more intimate in my instrumentation and yeah, to not make it as big. So. And then there's the narration. If, if there's a lot of narration, I typically like to stick to like, not to be too distracting. So right. like, I mean, I can be rhythmic, but I have to be very picky on what 
percussion or what synths I'm using that it's not like sticking out too much. So I think absolutely. Yeah. And JD, anything that helps yeah. you decide that process? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, using Chivalry 2 as a specific example, um, you know, for a game like that, like the audio space is very crowded already. Like there is, right. like sound design is a huge part of that, that game, especially like they want it to be loud. They want it to feel like you're in the middle of this medieval battle. So there's lots of shouting and screaming and, you know, swords clanking together and explosions and all that stuff. And so, you know, it was, it was a pretty easy call um, going back to talking about the dynamic music uh, to make sure that those first couple of, of layers of intensity were still relatively sparse uh, and, and didn't have a ton going on uh, to kind of let the sound design, you know, tell the story um, during those stages of the battle. And then when the music really comes in, as it gets a little bit more intense and down to the wire in a match, the music has more of an impact because it, it stands out a bit more uh, and it's not um, getting in the way and muddying up, uh, you know, like I said, the audio space, uh, like it would be if it was just kind of constantly, you know, there and, and, and in your face. Uh, and it kind of just makes it more impactful that way. Uh, and it lets the music uh, serve more of a purpose, I guess, kind of giving the player the feeling that things are coming down to the wire, which is, uh, it, it was kind of an easier call in a game like that, because you don't have to necessarily, like, like you were saying before, you don't have as much control over the, uh, you know, what the player might be doing or how the match is going to go. And so instead you're just deciding like, okay, where does the music need to be, you know, at, at this stage of the match. And then it can be that way forever, or it can ramp up, you know, to the end, depending on how the match goes. Absolutely. And for, for instrumentation though, I'm curious, cause like if you're dealing with a, a big sound design like that, and maybe you, do, the, do you lean on that sound design to help maybe influence what you're going to pick in terms of what instruments, like maybe like this, uh, you know, trombone sounds too close to an explosion or maybe, or yeah. Denise, if you're working with animals, maybe they're high pitched, maybe the strings don't mesh well with certain sounds and stuff. Does that make sense? Like, does that help dictate certain instruments like that? It truly does, actually. That's a very good question. There's one scene in Eden that it's, it's the coastal fjords and icebergs are melting and the sound is very deep like a lot of crushing sounds and water so I had to stay out of kind of like the very sub range just right. to get away to that the sound of the ice just kind of deep rumble yeah yeah and, J and JD I'm just kidding yeah. was it yeah with the uh, more action stuff is that yeah, like yeah maybe do strings like cut through more I don't know like <laughs> that's kind of exactly it like I, I ended up leaning on more melody and sort of you know big big soaring sort of orchestral you know gestures than I thought yeah. I was going to um because you know if, if I had used just you know a ton of really you know heavy percussion all the time it would have really gotten in the way of these really percussive or excuse me percussive you know, battle sounds that are really prominent constant uh, and it would have gotten lost in all of that. And, 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 you know, at worst, it would have made it worse and it muddied it up, which is not what I wanted to do. So I had to kind of right. use that stuff a little bit more selectively and rely more on sort of traditional orchestral elements. Absolutely. Um, so let's, I, I want to pitch this question to everybody and we'll kind of go in a line and, and, and talk about it. And, you know, I think it's fun to talk about what inspires us and what do we listen to and what uh, we like. And so I'm, I'm curious if anybody has an example of a score by a composer that you admire that you felt was like very pivotal to the film or, or show's story, or maybe a moment that stands out from a movie from maybe where you're growing up or recently that the music kind of like, kind of stole your attention and everything. And, I'll, you know, we can start with uh, Jonathan. Oh, sure. Anything? I mean, the, the thing that always immediately creep jumps to mind when people ask this because I don't think he's a particularly well-known composer and he actually passed away a couple of years ago it was Jean Francois Hugues Chanfro's score yeah. for um Inside La Interior this French yeah. horror film um from like I want to say 2008 maybe something like that 2007 um that I think is just I mean all of his scores are really remarkable um and and sort of poorly represented in releases that you can hear unfortunately score for donkey punch is also really great but the but the inside score is like i mean really the opposite score that i think i would have written having been given that movie and it's it like it couldn't play against picture sort of harder for most of the movie and it's so effective and it's so it's so sweet and sort of and and beautiful and um and while this while this incredibly terrifying material is happening on screen 
And there's something about the contrast that works so beautifully and I just never would have thought of it. And I think it's the most impressive thing. Um, and it's really, yeah, it's really sad. I think when, that, when that composers juxtapose yeah. Yeah, that stuff like that, it, it's where you're, maybe you're seeing something really terrible and it's the most beautiful music you've heard that can pulse really strong emotions. Yeah, stuff like that is very interesting. It's, it's my favorite example of that. Um, wow. I think. Yeah, so people yeah. should check that out. <laughs> Um, Lewis, how about you? Is there any composer film score that really sticks out? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, recently I saw Tenet and I thought Ludwig Göransson's score in that, particularly just in the beginning, just set the tone. It was yeah. it was action and suspenseful, but it had this oddity that you do something, something else was going on and had some other other layer. And so it was, I don't know, I felt like you were <laughs> in the kind of action suspense zone but it was also somehow very bizarre and 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 cool and interesting to listen to yeah Ludwig is a fantastic composer i mean he really knows how to create a soundscape for sure um denise how about you i think my latest one would probably be either queen's gambit by oh yeah Rivera or do my hans two right. very different examples but very different <laughs> yeah i just Queen's Gambit was just, he just did, carried the story so well. He was like, he scored it like a proper film score. <laughs> well, team yeah. score just didn't stick out too much. But as a composer, I, to me, it was like phenomenal what he had done. Yeah, Carlos is a great guy. And I'm, that's, I'm so happy that he, you know, got so much attention for that because it was such a great job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, JD, how about you? Um, I'll, I'll give a video game example. That's, yeah. that's kind of a more personal one. Um, when I was about 13 years old or so, I, I got a PlayStation two and I had this game, final fantasy 10. And, um, I remember turning it or, you know, booting it up and, um, this beautiful piece of music came on when I first started the story, it's called two Xanarchan. And the composer is Nobu Yamatsu, who's a, a legend. And I didn't know that yeah. at the time, but, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. uh, but yeah, it's just this very delicate, you know, emotional, very sparse, beautiful piano piece. Um, and it's playing while the main character is basically explaining, you know, this is, this is how we got to where you see us right now. Um, and this isn't, this isn't meant to be like any kind of like historical statement. I know like video game music, you know, did this well before in some, in some cases and certainly afterwards, but this is the first time, like as a 13 year old sitting there playing this game that, uh, music made me feel emotional in that way from a video game sure yeah. um, because even though I'd never met these characters before it, the music was telling me uh that they had had been through some stuff and I was empathizing with them without even knowing them. uh and so I, I yeah that's that's always stands out as an example to me of something that, that some a piece of music that just fits something so well um yeah, that's, that's my yeah idea. because I, yeah when you talk about how music has changed in games but going back to that era I mean I grew up you know playing Chikino's Medal of Honor and that's I didn't know who Michael yeah. Chikino was at that time but hearing those kind of scores that really were like whoa this is another medium that's really capable of doing that that's amazing yeah, yeah. um so to to flip it now we'll go back and go uh, down the line uh, I'd like to know if there's a piece of music that you all have done that you're particularly maybe proud of that you feel very, uh, it was creatively rewarding for you that really kind of, you know, didn't feel like it was just getting a piece of music out, but something that maybe felt a little bit more personal. So uh, Jonathan, I'll jump back over to you. Oh, sure. I mean, uh, one of the projects I did this uh, this last year, 2021, um, was, a, was a piece with Center Theater Group and my good friend and collaborator, Marika Splint, <laughs> called 32 Acres, that actually took the form of an app. So I had sort of jumped into, mm -hmm. I jumped into dynamic music programming and had to learn F mod and uh, a bunch of unity, unity triggering. And it was this GPS enabled uh, sort of sound walk that happened in a park in downtown LA at the state historic park. Um, wow. And it ended up being, you know, uh, an hour long, long sort of dynamic composition made entirely out of field recordings recorded in the park and then some additional sort of musical elements. Um, and it was like, I mean, it was like being in college again, like, using so much software that I had never touched before and just like not really knowing what I was doing and just having to go for it and having a deadline. And I was really, really thrilled with how it came out. Unfortunately, it's not running and can't download it anymore, but um, but I'm sure we'll we'll sort of release some documentation of it somehow. Um, yeah, that sounds amazing. Really, really wow. fun project to do, yeah. 
That sounds great. Uh, Lewis, how about yourself? Anything that uh, really creatively rewarding for you that you kind of hold on to? Um, yeah, I mean, I can keep it to, in Twyla Moves. Um, there was a scene that was just really, I guess, challenging for me. Uh, it was a, it was about Twyla Tharp and her son, and they were kind of reflecting on his childhood and sort of her balancing his busy career as a single mother raising a child. And it was, you know, it was very sensitive. There was a lot of emotions going on, very complicated, and it tried a lot of things. And it was just one of those scenes that felt very, very complicated to, to approach and yeah. uh, to, to produce something for. Um, but ultimately, you know, what, what came out, I, I thought every, everyone was, was proud with and myself included kind of encapsulated a lot in, in, in a yeah. short amount of time. And it's always, it's always great when you like crack it, right. When you just like, you know, you've cracked it and you can finally like feel it. Yeah. <laughs> It was, it was, it was a bit like that moment, like a, a lot of being overwhelmed and like, oh no, this is huge. And I don't know. And then yeah. being like a little bit okay with, okay. Yeah. That release. You're like, oof, we did it. <laughs> um, Denise, how about you? Jumping off of Lewis's point of like, it's, it's always the challenging ones, the complex ones that are mm. in the end become the most rewarding ones. And I'm going to go back to this scene from Eden about the flamingos and the tornado and it, it, there was more to that like in the beginning of yeah. that scene it was it was actually sad and dangerous so bridging that into this tornado threat that wasn't actually a threat into this freedom moment being able to bridge all those emotions and at the same time be thematic and at the same time be rhythmically interesting in points like there were a lot of items in my checklist that needed to be in that scene that I, I feel like I ended up nailing. And it's more personal to me because we were doing this episode. It was like towards the end of the project. So, you know, we were months deep in and I was really feeling my freedom <laughs> coming soon. So that freedom moment, I was like, I was, I, I almost, actually not lying. I cried when I finished that. Like, yeah. I, like the end is near. <laughs> so it was personal. It was technical. It was all of the different challenges that I was able to put together. And it was such a great feeling. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> that, that emotional release. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd cry too. I mean, it was fantastic. Uh, JD, how about you? Um, yeah, I'd probably have to say the, the main theme for Chivalry 2. Um, it, it's my first proper main theme. And so it has yeah. kind of a special place in my heart. And the other thing is it's the first, you know, piece of music that I actually heard, you know, performed uh, by a proper orchestra. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's going to always kind of have a, a special place in my heart. And the other thing is like, it's definitely still the one I lost the most sleep over as well for all of yeah. those reasons. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, probably Chivalry 2's main thing. I mean, that must be amazing just to hear it played live for the first time by like, by an orchestra. I mean, that for as a composer yeah. to hear that. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure my that, that my only regret, or not a regret, my, I, I hope it was all during the pandemic and we recorded yes. it in Budapest. And so I was attending, you know, remotely, I was attending the session remotely. So obviously right. the next step is I'd love to be like there <laughs> in, in, the, the yeah, in the room to feel the but, air. That's, uh, a, that's a different yeah, experience, but just to feel see like it there was and, and something missing, yeah. but, but still amazing nonetheless. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So um, to, to kind of uh, maybe wrap things up a bit, uh, we'll go back down the line and uh, you know, I, I'd love to know if you have any advice for you know anybody who's looking to break into this industry? There's so many people who maybe don't know where to start, or maybe if you give an example of maybe how you got your foot in the door, or what you've learned in your time in this industry. And for anybody who's you know looking to to follow in these footsteps, uh, if you have any piece of advice to give, one piece of advice, what would it be? And we'll go back to Jonathan. Well, yeah, I mean, I I had a very sort of atypical career path to get here. Like I didn't go to music school. Um, and and never really intended to make music my career and I sort of haven't I guess because I do a lot of sound design as well but um but I say yes to everything that seems good I guess I mean that's that's what I did right and yeah. that's what I still do is I absolutely say yes to everything sort of irregardless of budget if you seem interesting and it seems like an interesting project and something I want to be associated with I will find a way to make it happen still and I you know, everybody says everybody, you know, you need to get paid and you need to make sure you're paid and you, you do to a certain extent, but um, 
I would have missed out on a lot of like sort of big stepping stone uh, projects and relationship buildings if I yeah. had, if I had really, you know, if I had been really a stickler about it. There are projects you do for money and there are projects you do because you love them. And it's really important to not, to not turn your back on those. Absolutely. And I think the relationship part is the, the big thing because for anybody who's not in, in Hollywood or in the industry real, needs to realize that it's about building those relationships and, and, you know, yeah. they're going to call on you if they can trust you and, and fall back on you for sure. And, and that being said, also be instantly distrusting of anyone who wants to pay you an exposure <laughs> or building relationships, right? You can yeah, usually <laughs> feel those out, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, um... <laughs> so there's a lot of sharks out there. So be careful. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, Lewis, how about yourself? Any advice to give? Um, yeah, I mean, I also had somewhat non-traditional. I mean, I started out editing and music was something that was a part of my life, like playing in bands and very different very different uh, way to relate to it, but but slowly kind of integrated into what I was doing with editing and became just another part of, of, of filmmaking for me. I feel like my piece of advice would be, you know, every project's different and it's certainly a collaborative process making a film, but to just always maintain your own voice and that's kind of your best uh, currency because you're the only one who can do you. So make sure in every project you do that you are are shining through. Absolutely. Bring, find what you can bring to the project and not what the project can bring to you, essentially. I think that's a good piece. I heard James Gunn say that, I think, once. I'm stealing that from James Gunn, but he always said, what can you bring to the project and, you know, add your your, your two cents to it? And Because it, it is a collaborative thing. It's not about you and what it's going to do for you. It's about what you can bring to everything. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Denise, how about you? I get asked this question a lot by musicians, and nobody wants to become a film composer without already being a musician. So, and a lot of the, uh, the perspective that I get is that I'm, you know, it's, it's so daunting, like film composing seems like such an involved, highly technical skill. Yeah. And I think my piece of advice is like, don't be overwhelmed by the technical side of it, because I've been doing this for 10 years and I'm still learning, like that's never going to stop. Like you're always going to be advancing technically, but if you focus on, yourself as a musician and what harmonies and melodies can you write and what instrument you already play and know and you know being able to tell a story with what you already have it's you're already a composer like you're it's already a good start and then yeah. as you go you know learn a new skill one at a time instead of doing you know trying to learn everything all at once and no information is retained so much because of that. Yeah, that's, no, that's absolutely great advice. <laughs> um, but also, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, the technical thing shouldn't scare people because a lot of people might think like, oh, right, there's no way I can do this. I don't know this. Just, just do it. You'll learn it. If other people can do it and you want to apply yourself to it, you'll figure it out. <laughs> um, JD, how about you? Any advice? Yeah, I mean, kind of similar to what you know, Jonathan and Lewis were saying about sort of having a different path. Um, I think it sounds like we all sort of have unique paths when compared to one another. And um, that's kind of something to embrace. I think, I think it's easy to get hung up on how other people got to where you want to be. Um, and obviously there's plenty you can take from, from those examples and, and, and all that, but um, your own path is often what will kind of give you your unique voice when compared to everybody else. And I think that that is really important in this industry. Um, but I also actually think my main piece of advice would be to make sure you're paying attention to and not neglecting your mental health. <laughs> and that's, you know, advice that can be applied to any field, I suppose, but this sure. can be a very like isolating, you know, gig sometimes. And just make sure that when something's bugging you, you're, you have someone you can talk to and all of that, because it can be pretty easy to sort of get overwhelmed and feel like, you know, you're sort of on your own. Um, and yeah, that, that's some, that's advice I'm needing to pay more attention to myself <laughs> for sure. Uh, but mental health is super important and, and make sure you, you know, you're taking the steps to, to keep, to keep that in check for sure. Yeah. Especially now uh, yeah. working through this pandemic was, I mean, I think it's very important. And I think all of us are sitting yeah. here on zoom right now. I work yeah. at Cartoon Network Studios. We're, we're, we're used to being in the room together. We're used to working together and we went all instantly instantly we're all remote you know and we still were working for the yeah. entire pandemic and that 
being alone all of a sudden and just looking at the screen and you're in your room and there's no one behind me right now. It's like, it's weird, yeah. right? It's just like, it, can it is really weird. Your, yeah. It can mess with your head a bit. <laughs> and it is important to take yeah. care of yourself and, and enjoy, and enjoy the, enjoy the little things in your life that you enjoy doing for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but uh, well, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, JD, Denise, Lewis, Jonathan, for all of your insight tonight. Uh, you guys are fantastic and congratulations to all of your, your work that you've done. Uh, they're all fantastic projects as well. And uh, thanks for everyone who's tuning in and, and joining us and watching us. Uh, thank you to Impact 24 PR for helping put this together. Uh, we have two more panels that you can check out at filmmusicmedia.com. And uh, thank you so much. Have a great evening. <laughs>